Bow your heads, please. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day you've given us. I want to thank you that everybody made it here safely. I want to pray that anybody who couldn't make it here um, is okay and that you'll help them if they couldn't make it because of that. Um, I want to pray that this science class goes well and that we all learn something and take something away from this class. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, ma'am. Okay. Um, Julia actually uh, asked a uh, question at the end of class last week, but I'd already let you guys go, and it was a really good question, because last week we were working on um, basically spiritual warfare and the armor of God and how, have you guys been praying that on yourselves, I hope? Okay. Um, and it's a really good thing to, to do that every day, to praise God and honor him and thank him for the things that he's blessed you with and to pray on the armor for the day because you have no idea what's going to happen that day but you can be sure that the enemy's going to try to mess you up because that's his whole job that's his whole existence um, and so she asked about the seven sons of Sceva and I don't know if you know who I think that's how you say the guy's name <laughs> aren't you glad that's not your name anyway um, and these were guys that were running around using the name of Jesus to cast out demons and make money. And um, what happened was the demons apparently said to the guy, um, I know Paul and I know Jesus, not in that order, I know Jesus, I know Paul, so who are you? And they beat the guys up and they ran out um, bloodied and naked, if I remember the words from the scriptures. wasn't a good thing. Um, and so she asked about that. And, and I didn't go into this, but if you ever are in a situation where you're praying to rebuke a specific spirit that the Lord's put on your heart, that you and Jesus' authority are saying you're not allowed in me, whether that be the spirit of, I'm going to use one of mine, gluttony, okay, and you rebuke the spirit of gluttony in the name of Jesus, I rebuke the spirit of gluttony, I'm a child of the one true king, you have no business being in my life, I no longer am going to allow you access to me, I, I will not entertain you anymore, get out of here because of the blood of Jesus, then the scripture Scripture says you're supposed to also pray, please, Lord, fill me with the, the, your Holy Spirit, the spirit of self-control, the spirit of peace, the spirit of those things, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, fruits of the spirit type thing, okay? Because it also, there's another scripture that talks about when the demons were run out of this one person, that they weren't filled with the, the spirit of God, and therefore they came back and brought friends with them when they came back. You've probably remember hearing that scripture before, too. So you never want to um, pray out a spirit in the name of Jesus without also praying in the Holy Spirit and the fruits of the Spirit, that would be the obvious choice of taking the place of whatever that sin might have been. Does that make sense? Okay. I'm not a pastor, so I'm doing the best I can with that, with that for you, but I'm using the scriptures that have pointed to that direction and she asked that question last week it was a really good question and so wanted to, to address that last two weeks we spent on spiritual health because we're in our health and wellness part so today and next week actually are going to be fun if you'll participate and I'm hoping you will participate um, because we're looking at relationships and how to have healthier relationships now because most of the people that are really looking at trying to get better relationships are married people and so they're trying to figure out how to have a better relationship with their husband or wife or they're trying to figure out how to have a better relationship with their children because trust me when you have your first child you guys don't come with little instruction manuals and it radically shakes, at least it radically shook my life when I had my first child. I remember my older brother, whose uh, oldest child, his only child, is 18 months older than mine. And so they were close in age, and we were going through this basically at the same time. And I remember he said to me, wow, they're not just little tape recorders. They're little video recorders. Anything you do, they do. It's really scary. <laughs> and it is. Parenting can be a really scary experience. But what, in my experience, I, I can only speak from my experience. So please be aware that when I say things today, um, if, if it doesn't come from the reading, if it's my experience, that's all it is, is my experience. I am a wretched sinner saved by grace. So I am no better than anybody else. I just want to make that very clear. Um, but... In my experience, when I had my 
uh, children, it really forced me to look at God differently. And that's really when God got a hold of me. I think I was saved before I got pregnant with my first child. And the reason I say I think I was saved is because if you'd asked me, I would have told you that Jesus is Lord, he's God the Son, and that I believed in him with all my heart. But I had no idea what was in the Bible, and I didn't live very differently than anybody else because I was what I would consider a very stunted baby Christian that never grew. But when I got pregnant with my first child, <sighs> that just shook my world at the very foundations. But you have to understand, it was my second marriage. I had, um, I didn't want to have a third, if you get my drift. I knew my husband didn't want any children right then because our marriage wasn't doing very well. Um, and so when I found out I was pregnant, I freaked. But I knew also that I wasn't going to abort her. But I was just scared to death of what was going to happen. And that's actually, <laughs> I remember where I was when actually uh, north of Lion Country Safari in the middle of nowhere doing my jogging. And I, on the way towards Lion Country Safari, remember saying to God, look, God, <laughs> now this shows you where I was at. Look, God, you can't do any worse than I have with my life. So if you want what's left, you can have it. Can you imagine talking to the God of the universe that way? But that's where I was at. And I remember where I was on the jog back from Lion Country Safari when the Holy Spirit put in my mind, okay, fine, I want your mind now. He wanted my mind. See, if you asked, he had my heart, but he didn't have my mind. I was not filled with any knowledge of God's word. And so I started to listen to Moody Radio everywhere I went. And I started, and you got to understand, I, I was in sales at the time. I was in my car five days a week driving all over the state of Florida. So I started listening, and, and I didn't just come up with Moody Radio. I went to see somebody that saw a cross on me and says, what does that mean? Does that mean anything to you? And he challenged me, and he said, well, you should listen to Moody Radio. Started listening to Moody Radio. Started to find a church. Started to um, to study my Bible to find out for myself what was in it. And God was faithful, and He He led me and He met me. Now I was 28 years old, and so I can honestly say God radically grabbed my life when I had that first child. And my husband wasn't saved by any stretch of the imagination, and wasn't. I remember his sister said, your wife's starting to sound like a missionary. And I remember at the time being a young enough Christian that I was very uncomfortable with that. And then I thought, something's wrong with this picture because that's how I'm supposed to sound. You know what I'm saying? But I, had, I didn't have a support group or anything. So when I say to you children can radically grab your life and shift them, God can really get a hold of you with your children. And I kind of feel sorry for people that never have children because I don't think they ever quite understand God the same way. Can the moms give me an amen here? That, that you never quite understand God the same way as when you have children because then as your children do things to you and you whine to God, God's going to say, that's just what you do to me. And I've heard that more times than I want to tell you that God has said that to me when I've complained to him about what my children have done. It's just what you do to me, child. And I'm like, oh. So at least he gets my attention. Anyway, so we're going to do relationships. I had no intention of doing that. I guess God wanted me to say that. So anyway, relationships are very important. And I know you guys aren't married yet, but you have relationships. And I don't know if you realize this yet, but relationships outside of God's word, which is eternal in this life, People are the other thing that's eternal in this life, which means your relationships with people are of eternal value because those people are of eternal value. So how important are they? They're more important than the time you spend on anything else except for with God and in his word. Does that make sense to everybody? Which means what we're going to learn in this next two weeks is very important to our relationships with other people. And these are things that I wish I had known before I got married. I wish I had known. And these are things that after I got married, it was by the grace of God and James Dobson at Focus on the Family and Moody Radio and the different people that were on there that kept me married because I was starting to seek after God and God was faithful to give me the information I needed. If you guys can learn this information now, your kingdom work will be so much better because you'll be able to understand how different people are wired differently. And you tell me, who chooses to wire people the way they're actually wired? 
Who? God, God does. Absolutely. There's a verse in the Old Testament, uh, in Proverbs, actually, that says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll come back to it. Have you ever heard that one before? Parents have that one memorized, trust me. Um, that actual Hebrew word, I've heard by some pastors, is the bent of a branch. Train up a child in the way he should go. That's the bend of a branch. In other words, the child is already bent in a certain direction. You're to bend them towards the Lord with that bent that already exists. So it's important that we, we learn to figure those things out about one another because that way we won't have so much anger or malice or feel so hurt towards other people that we care about because we'll understand them better. There was some very good information in here, uh, even for right now, even though I know this stuff, I still was blessed by reading through it again to get ready to speak with you. Now, in your reading, you started with joy. And in one of my Bible studies I was in, one of the ladies said, joy stands for Jesus, others, and you. You got that? It's an acronym, isn't it? Jesus, others, you. And that's the order we should be putting things in our life. Jesus should always be first. Others should always be next. And you, us, should be last. In other words, we don't need to be self-centered, do we? And if we will live with Jesus first, others next, and ourselves last, we tend to have joy. Now, please be aware, joy is not happiness. Happiness is dependent upon circumstances. If things aren't going very well, you may not be very happy. Uh, I'm going to use an example that's going to be happening in my life in the next 10 years because my mother's very elderly. When my mother passes away and goes to heaven, I will not be happy. I will be happy that she's in heaven with Jesus, but I will not be happy for me, okay? Because I love her very much and I'm, I will miss her very much. So circumstances can dictate happiness, but circumstances can't dictate joy because our joy is based on Jesus. And does he change? No, that is absolutely a rock, a foundation that's not the sifting, sifting sands, correct? So we can be solid on that joy. And it tells us in, in your reading um, that joy is a fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. It's right in there in the, the beginning of it, isn't it? So joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It says it doesn't depend on circumstances because what it does depend on is who God is. And the example it gave is actually one of my favorite books in the New Testament. Testament. Does anybody remember which one is the book of joy in the New Testament? Yes, Nick. Philippians. Philippians is the book of joy. Do you remember from your reading? Where was Philippians written from? Where was Paul when he wrote the book of Philippians? Yes, ma'am. He was in prison. He was suffering. He wasn't in house arrest like he was when he was in uh, Rome. He was actually in a wretched cell, possibly chained, cold, the whole bit. And yet, the whole book of Philippians keeps saying to be joyful. Rejoice always. And over and over, he says to be joyful. And so it's the book of joy. Yet it was written from a prison cell. That shows us that joy is not dependent upon circumstances, doesn't it? Joy is dependent upon who God is and who we are in him, in Jesus Christ. And so that's a good thing. And then it says joy is a choice. We can choose, and this is one that keeps coming back to me, we can choose to look at what God has done for us and be thankful. Or we can choose to whine about what's not going the way we think it's supposed to go. Ooh, I'm very convicted about that one. Because whining is a sin. Anytime we complain, no matter what's going on, anytime we complain, do you guys realize that that's a sin? And it's a sin because God is in control. He is El Elyon. He is sovereign, which means he has everything under control. So when we're whining, we're whining against him. Do any of you know what happened to Miriam, Moses' sister in the Old Testament, when she whined? It, yes. She ended up getting struck with leprosy. Dude, that was good that you knew that. Yes, God really takes a severe look at complaining, doesn't he? He struck Miriam with leprosy because she was complaining. Any complaining really is against the Lord. If he is God, if he is in control, then any complaining we do is saying that God has let you down. Ouch. Don't think I've gotten that one under control yet. I repent on that one a lot, okay? But the point is, at least I'm aware. And when the Holy Spirit calls me to it, I do repent. And I say, you know, I'm supposed to be looking at what he has done for me, not what hasn't gone the way I think it's supposed to, right? So... The one last thing I want to say about joy is not in here, but my pastor said this in a sermon just a couple weeks ago, and it really struck me. Um, 
when the Queen is at Buckingham Palace in England, they run the flag up so that everybody knows the Queen is there. And if she's in one of her other palaces, where other, whatever palace she's in, they run the flag up so that people know that she's there. So far, so good? Well, my pastor said, and I think he read this as a quote from somebody else, but he said that joy is the flag that a believer should have showing that Jesus is in residence in you. I don't know about you, but that was a good picture to me. That when I'm not joyful and I allow myself to look at my circumstances and them get me down, that's not showing that Jesus is in residence, is it? And I told you in the last couple weeks I've had an issue with that, that I took my eyes off of Jesus and started to sink. Kind of like when Peter was looking at Jesus, he's walking on the water and man, he looks down and you know, and I, I, I was swimming, man. So, and repenting. Um, so if we keep our focus on the Lord and if we put that flag of joy up and keep a thankful heart, remember it says rejoice, always pray without ceasing and everything give thanks for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Right there, right? So if we're thankful and have a joyful spirit, then we show who's in residence in our lives and that's important. Okay, so then we got to the five love languages and this, this is big and um, I know you might not think so, but a lot of marriages. Uh, did you like how he went through this? Uh, Gary Smalley has, has written some great books. And um, he went through how the first two years of your marriage usually is this emotional obsession stage where you're just so, oh, got such a, I feel, excuse me saying so, got such a major crush on the person, just, oh, oh, they can't do any wrong. Anybody that says anything, you just don't hear it because you're just so goo goo gaga. Okay, that's a girl's version. I don't know what guys do, but anyway. Um, but they still have that same emotional obsession when you fall in love, and that's why you end up getting married. Now, that can be very dangerous, can't it? If you haven't gone in with your eyes open, with a spiritual list of things that this person has to be a believer, this person has to be, you know, if you're a, a dedicated believer, that you, you go in with those things. And, and let's be honest, uh, my husband wasn't a believer, just like I just told you. I prayed for over 10 years for my husband's salvation, and God was faithful. And eventually... He crossed over. Um, I personally believe homeschooling had a lot to do with that because he was involved in the homeschooling process and my kids would be reciting their Awana verses to him. And I mean, the poor guy was just so inundated with scripture. You know what I'm saying? He had no hope. Anyway, <laughs> so, um, but the point is that there might be a list of things that uh, are important that you make sure that whoever you're even considering getting involved in would be true because once we give our hearts, we don't see very well. And then did you notice he said after about two years, you get over that stage and then it's got to be intentional love. And that's very, very true. And a lot of people in our country just get divorced at that point because they think, oh, I don't love that person anymore, including Christian people. We have just as high a divorce rate as the world does. And I actually know somebody that just went through this, a precious young man that was homeschooled, Christian homeschooler, and got married. And within 18 months, his wife decided she wants to date other people and she wants to do other things. And and it just crushed him. And so uh, this is very important that you make sure who you marry has the same uh, moral compass that you do. It, it helps, okay, greatly. So at that point, you have to choose to love each other. You choose to. And I remember getting to a point in my marriage where I started praying, Lord, my marriage should glorify you. Help me to adore my husband in a way that that honors you, that makes other people see you in our relationship. And God answered that prayer. And, and we have actually, my husband and I have met in places where people looked at us and said, are you guys having an affair? And we looked at him and we said, why would you say that? And they go, by the way, you're acting with each other. And I thought, wow, Lord, you really answered my prayer. Because there was a point in our marriage that we didn't even like each other, honestly. And I really like my husband now as well as love my husband. But because I, I really believe that with all my heart, it's because I asked the Lord to make it something that brings him honor and glory. And I was willing to do the work before the Lord. And do you know where most of the work was? It wasn't with my husband. It was with me. I can't change my husband, but I can change me, can't I, with the Holy Spirit's help. So that's where all of us should be working on, is ourselves, right? To, to be Christ-like and to be conformed to the image of Jesus. And so when you learn these love languages, it helps. 
And I told the chemistry class this the other day. I forget why it came up, but they, they were laughing so hard they were in tears. And, and I'm, it's so sad that I'm that funny. But anyway, um, and I don't mean to be, but I'm that stupid sometimes and that sad. You learned about these love languages. I'm going to tell you my version. When I first got married, my husband, who was raised with a little money, so they had a maid, um, a housekeeper that came in every day and cleaned up and cooked the meals and stuff. Um, well, when I got married, I never had any of that. Matter of fact, the kids across the street had a maid and when they said, oh, you have a maid? I said, yeah, me and my mom. You know, we got two. Uh, in my mind, that's how it worked, you know. Um, but when we got married, my husband, because he was used to that, like towels, when he used a towel, and I'm not ratting my husband out. This is just how it was when you're first married. Any towel he used? Tunk. Now, when we first got married, we didn't even have a washer dryer. And he would drop towels on the floor. And I'm looking at him like, where do you think you're getting more towels? You know? I'm not going to the laundromat to wash those towels that you just happened to throw down. And it got to where I actually said, these are my towels. You cannot touch them. You do whatever you want with your towels. That way I wasn't going to divorce him. You know, that was still in that emotionally uh, obsessed stage. And I'm like, you know. And then when I got past that into the intentional stage, it got to where he would drop his clothes on the floor wherever he was. Now, now, do you know the difference in my attitude? Now I tell him I'm on the clothes Easter egg hunt because I go around the house looking for the clothes. Okay, so I've just made it a game, you know, so that I didn't kill him. Um, <clears throat> but the point is that at that point, I didn't know the five love languages. And I remember, now you guys have done the reading, so you'll be able to appreciate this. I remember when I would walk around the house picking up his clothes, thinking he does not love me. He would not do this if he had any love for me or respect for me. Now, what do you think one of my primary love languages is? Think. He's, he's dropping things and making work for me around the house. Acts of service. Absolutely. Thank you. Acts of service. I'm like up here on acts of service. And my husband, it's like down here. Okay? So I would say something to him, and he'd look at me and go, what planet are you from that you would think I don't love you because I drop my clothes on the floor? Right? I mean, normal people would just think, but see, I didn't know about love languages that, at that point. Okay, our first Christmas together, he bought me a beautiful watch. It was the most that he could spend, and it was, a, it was probably a $200 watch 32 years ago. Okay, it was a beautiful watch. It really was. I go, oh, okay, thanks. What is one of my lowest love languages? Gifts. <sighs> I don't understand it. I try to do the best I can now. My children, knowing that my gifts is like down here, will say to me when they buy me a gift, now, Mom, be gracious. Work hard at it, Mom. Because I'm just not good at it. I don't give gifts well. I, I, do, I don't do cards. I'm, I'm like, no, I'll call you. But I don't do cards. You know what I'm saying? I just have a rule. It's hard for me. Um, and so... My family's had to learn to deal with that, but my husband gifts are up here. Oh. So I had to learn to come up with gifts. My children help me now. That's the blessing of having adult children that know the five love languages. Another thing, have you guys noticed, some of you probably were here, some of you were here before Christmas, and so when you give me, a, you do give me a gift, what do I give you back when you give me a gift? Thank you, Emma. I hug you. Guess what one of my top love languages is? Physical touch. I touch total strangers when I'm trying to say something nice to them, which some people, it freaks them out. But other people probably have the same love language and they respond very nicely to it, you know. But that always freaks my husband out. He's like, you touch everybody. Well, because that's one of my top love languages. Now, I personally think that Part of that is how you're raised. I think one of my mom's top love languages is touch. And so my mom hugged us all the time. And, and that's why we're very touchy-huggy. How many of you come from a, a mom who's very touchy-huggy? Okay. And not all moms are. You notice some of these hands didn't go up. My second child, when she was born, it totally freaked us out because she'd be on your lap the whole time. Like this, all over you, the whole time. So when I learned these love languages, I was like, oh, Brisa is like, touch is up here. And thank you, Jesus. She married a guy whose touch is up here, too. So every time you see them, they're holding on to each other. You know what I'm saying? And I'm thinking, oh, good. That's fell in that love tank because that poor child, if she married somebody that didn't touch her, she wouldn't know what to do. Now, for my husband, he came from a family that didn't touch. So it was down here for him. That was another thing. I didn't think he loved me. He didn't hug me before he left. You know, he, and that's it. No, 
<sighs> you know, bear hug. And I'm like, what's wrong with this picture? He, he still doesn't hold hands. He knows that it, I'm a touch person now, so every once in a while he'll reach over and he'll grab my hand and go like this because he knows it matters to me. But do you know how God saved us on that one? God sent me three girls. Three girls. I was so crying out to the Lord. Lord, I'm starving for touch. I need touch. I need it so badly, and I need it from him. And God kept saying to me, I'm your husband too, and I have to be enough until I teach him. God sent us three girls. And guess what my husband learned with three girls? How to stroke them and hug them and love them and hold their little hands. And then I could look at him and go, honey, I'm your little girl too. And I'm not getting it from anybody else. And then it hit him and he went, oh, didn't get it for the big girl. But he got it with the little girls, and he could translate that to the big girl. You see what I'm saying? So God was faithful, and he met my need. I know, I'm really getting personal here, but I'm trying to show you how this really does play in to everything. It really does matter. Words of affirmation. I think everybody needs a certain amount of words of affirmation. And so when we only say negative things, it crushes people. Our words have the power of life or death in them, don't they? That's what scripture says, life or death. What do we want to choose to give other people? We want to choose to give them life. That's right. We want to choose to give them life. And our words can permanently hurt people. I bet you can think of something that someone said to you in anger that hurt you at some point in time, and it still hurts if you think about it. I bet every one of us can do that, can't we? Because words can cut very deeply. They'll say, six sticks and stones uh, may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Whoever said that never read the scripture and never had somebody say something really bad to them, did they? Our words, the scripture says, have the power of life or death and we really need to speak life and that's why those of you that have been with me a while I asked you to memorize uh, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of our mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their need that it may benefit those who listen that's very very important that our words speak life and that they don't say we don't say things that aren't speaking the truth in love some people go oh I'm speaking the truth mm. no you got to speak the truth in love that makes a difference okay so out of the love languages, and yeah, I didn't tell you this. See, I told the chemistry class this. Men tend to like the spending time one particularly. I know we all have a certain amount that we want the people that love us to spend time with us, but men, adult men, tend to want their wives to sit next to them no matter what they're doing. Now, you guys all have parents, so you've seen this, all right? Where the father wants mom to come wherever he is and sit there, and mom goes, I got 8,000 things I got to take care of. Dinner's over here burning. I got to fold clothes. I got the kids to homeschool. I don't have time to just sit there with you, right? You've heard this. I can tell because you're laughing. And so I, I heard on one program where this lady was told, uh, you know, your husband needs you to just sit next to him and spend time with him. And so the lady said she was going to test it. I love this. She was going to test it. So her husband's out working on something in the garage. So she carries a chair out, and she puts the chair in the garage, and she sits down. And the husband looks at her, and he goes, what are you doing, honey? She goes, nothing. I just thought I'd hang out with you for a little while. So she's sitting there, and she's thinking, and... He keeps working, and about 10 minutes later, he looks at her, he goes, I really like this. And she's thinking, oh, no, it's true, you know, because the woman's sitting there probably dying to go back in and do whatever she has to do to get it done, but this was an experiment, and she found it was true. And so what I found is that I schedule time to be sitting next to my husband while he's watching a program. And do you know how specific this is? That if I'm reading while he's watching the program, he goes, well, aren't you going to spend any time with me? <laughs> Seriously. So it, the, the spending time thing is very, very important. Now, all children want time. Do, do you guys have any little brothers or sisters? Okay. And did you notice in the reading it said that spending time means putting down whatever you're doing and actually looking at them eyeball to eyeball and spending time? How much do your little brothers and sisters like that when you actually put everything down and look them in the eye and pay attention to what they're saying? Do they like that? Come on, do they like that? Yeah. Do you know how rarely anybody in my family gets that from me? Seriously. It's, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed at how little, especially with my grandson, because he'll literally grab my hand and drag me away from whatever I'm doing and then look at me. And my grandson is on the autistic spectrum, so he doesn't speak. He just grabs me and drags me away, and then he looks at me. Like, aren't you going to? Or then he'll put my hand on his toys, or he'll hand me Play-Doh. 
Like, come on, let's do it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, so the point is that um, spending time is important. So what have we got here? We've got five love languages. And I told you that my first probably is touch. And then my second one is acts of service. I'm pretty sure. <clears throat> so how do you think my kids know how to say I love you to mom? What do you think they do when they want to say I love you? They hug me. And what else can they do? Clean the kitchen. Clean the house. Serious stuff. My oldest daughter, she will literally say to you, did you see what I did for you? Because she'll clean. Because she knows when I come home, I feel loved when somebody has bothered to do that. And when I come home and there's dishes in and the place is trashed, I literally feel like somebody has assaulted me. That's how strong these love languages really are. I want you to understand that. So I'm telling you this as uh, a deficit in my character or whatever, but I'm telling you this so that you understand. If your mom or your dad is one of these, then you, you might want to wash your dad's car. Do you see what I'm saying? And to your dad, it could have an overwhelming, wow, I love you and respect you, to, to the point where you don't understand why it gets him so weird. But that's because this may be one of his, okay? Um, and I just said that gifts for me, but I like gifts, don't get me wrong. I'm just not good at it compared to the others, okay? And then what were the, the other ones? Do you remember? I know what I'm next on is words of affirmation. Before I ever heard about the love languages, I remember saying to my parents, I feed on your praise. I actually said that to them when I was a young teenager that I feed on your praise. I need you to tell me I'm doing this correctly. And if you'll tell me that, then I will keep moving in that direction. And that was pretty weird that I could figure that out as a teenager. Okay, so words of affirmation, but I think a lot of people really, do, do you guys need to hear you're doing it right? If you do a really big thing for your mom or dad, do you want your mom or dad and stop and say, wow, that was a good job. Thank you so much for doing that. Right? I think all of us want to be affirmed, and I think all of us want to be appreciated, what we're doing. So what, are, what, what am I missing here of the five, guys? Quality. quality time. That's right, quality time. Now, you guys took the test. Raise your hand. If, and, and notice that we're a combination of these. We all want all of these, but some of them are really... I can't be the only weird person in the world. Some of us are really different about certain ones, right? Uh, like when my husband, when we first got married, he's still this way. If you make a Christmas present for him, he'll literally take the box and shake it. He doesn't want to open it. He just wants to play with it. You know what I'm saying? He's a big gifts person. It's like, woohoo, up here for my husband. Well, here, guys, you've got the little test. Why don't you take it real quick? It looks like this right here. So here, let's do it together. I have, well, I have, I have. Relax, just do it. Let's do it together. Number one, and I just read that. Is it more meaningful for me when A, I receive a love note or text or email from a loved one, or E, that you get a hug? Okay. Number two, is it more meaningful to me when B, I can spend alone time with my best friend? Let's just say that, okay? Um, or D, my partner does something practical to help me out. Okay, number three, is it more meaningful to me when C, a partner gives me a little gift as a token of our love for each other, or, and, and you guys just put this to your friend, okay, or your brother or sister, or B, I get to spend uninterrupted leisure time with my friend. Number four, is it more meaningful to me when D, uh, my friend unexpectedly does something for me like filling my car or doing the laundry, or E, my partner and I touch. Uh, five, is it more meaningful to me when E, my partner puts, um, or my friend, let's see, puts their, puts her arm around me, okay, when we're in public. So in other words, your friend maybe, you know, pat you on the back or something. And then C, my, my friend surprises me with a gift. Is it more meaningful to me, this is number six, B, I'm around my friend even if we're not doing anything, or E, I hold hands with my friend. Okay, number seven. I know some of you might think that's weird, but I still hold my mom's hand wherever we go. I do. And I hold my kids' hands. And people know that in church. We're known for that because I will be holding all of my children the whole time we're worshiping, the whole time we're singing, any time we're praying, we grab each other's hands. So, I, you know, I do this stuff. Guess what, what mom's love language is? You know. 
So, okay, and not, my son-in-laws all know it now, and they all just grab hold, you know. It's, <laughs> they just go along. Number seven, it's more meaningful to me when uh, my friend gives me a gift or I hear I love you from my friend. Uh, number eight, it's more meaningful to me when I sit close to my partner or A, when I'm complimented by a loved one for no apparent reason. Um, number nine, I get the chance to just hang out with my partner. Or C, I unexpectedly get small gifts from my partner. Um, Ten, I hear my partner tell me I'm proud of you. Or D, my partner tells helps me with a task. Are you guys circling one for each one of these? Um, Eleven, I get to do things with my, my friend or partner. I hear supportive words from my partner as A. Uh, D, my partner, on number 12, my partner does things for me instead of just talking about doing nice things. Or E, I feel connected to my partner through a hug. Thirteen, I hear praise from my partner. Or C, my partner gives me something that shows me uh, he or she was really thinking about me. Fourteen, B, I'm able to just be around my partner. Or E, I get a back rubber massage from my partner. Fifteen, um, A, my partner reacts positively to something I've accomplished, or D, my partner does something for me that I know they don't particularly enjoy. That's the one my husband does for me. He'll do something that he really doesn't want to do, and he'll go, see? See what I did for you? Because he knows I'm an acts of service person. Um, 16, my partner and I kiss frequently. Well, for your friend and you, maybe let's say you hug. How's that? Uh, B, um, you sense your partner is showing interest in the things that you, that you care about. 17, D, my partner works on special projects with me that I have to complete, or C, my partner gives me an exciting gift. 18, A, I'm complimented by my partner on my appearance. B, my partner takes the time to listen to me and really understand my feelings. 19, E, my partner and I um, share just friendly touch in public. Or D, my partner offers to run errands for me. Uh, 20D, my partner does a bit more than his or her normal share of the responsibilities we share around the house or work-related stuff. And C, I get a gift that I know my partner uh, put thought into choosing. 21, my partner doesn't check his or her phone while we're talking. <laughs> that means they're paying attention. That's always nice. And D, my partner uh, goes out of their way to do something that relieves pressure on me. 22, uh, C, I can look forward to a holiday because of a gift I anticipate receiving. Or A, I hear the words, I appreciate you from my partner. 23, C, my partner brings me a little gift after he or she has been traveling without me. D, my partner takes care of something I'm responsible to do, but I feel too stressed to do at the same time. Hopefully you guys are picking one for each number. Okay, good. Good. See, you're way ahead of me. You're smarter than I am. Okay, 24. B, my partner doesn't interrupt me while I'm talking. Um, C, <laughs> nobody in my family respects that one. We're working on that. Okay. Uh, we all talk over each other. It's terrible. C, uh, gift giving is an important part of our relationship. Uh, 25D, my partner helps me when he or she knows I'm already tired uh, B, I get to do some. I get to go somewhere while spending time with my partner. Twenty-six. E, my partner and I are. Um, uh, we just touch each other. Let's just go there. And C, my partner gives me a little gift that he or she picked up in the course of their normal day. Twenty-seven. My partner says something encouraging to me. Or B, I get to spend time in shared activities or hobby with my partner. 28, C, my partner surprises me with a small token of their appreciation, or E, my partner and I touch a lot during the normal course of a day. 29, D, my partner helps me out, especially if I know they're already busy, and A, I hear my partner specifically say, uh, tell me I appreciate you. 30, um, my part E, my partner and I embrace after we've been apart for a while, or A, I hear my partner say how much I mean to him or her. Okay, now you're supposed to count up how many A's you had, how many B's you had, how many C's, how many D's, and how many E's. So why don't you do that? All right. Now, how many of you, your top love language is touch? I got, I I got two A's on like two. Oh, good. Okay. Do you mind sharing? Um, eight A, eight E. Okay, so A was... Hang on. 
A was, okay, words of affirmation, and B was quality time. Now, how many of you men, particularly, those were your top two, words of affirmation and quality time? Really, only one? That really surprises me, because I, in my experience, most men need words of affirmation and quality time. This is a new generation. I don't think so. I think as you grow up, you're going to need those two things. Okay, so those were your top two. George, what were your top two? Um, quality time uh -huh. and receiving gifts. Okay, that's my husband. That's, that's his, too. Clay, what were your top two, honey? I have being acts of service and receiving gifts. Okay. How about you? Quality time and receiving gifts. Okay. Quality time and receiving gifts. That's interesting. Several of you have been quality time and receiving gifts. That's interesting. How about you? Touch and quality time. Okay. So you, you notice the quality time is coming out a lot with the men, though. Let's see if it is for the ladies. Um, what did you get on that? Quality time and we'll get back to Oh, so the three were kind of even for you. Yeah. That was my three. Yep, no, my three are touch, acts of service, and, and words of affirmation. Sorry, but two of those are mine. Yes, how about you? Um, words of affirmation are like things as well. Wow, really, really important. Okay, we all need to remind her how much we love her and appreciate her. I'm serious. No, no, I'm serious. Because it helps you to, to I, I hate to say this, but you should get everybody in your family to take this test. Because then you would know how to show them you love them. It, it's really important. I know you think that's silly, but it's not. Then you know how to say I love you to that person. Because you know, as I was reading these to you, to me, to you, it just hit me. I hear my youngest daughter, who is about to get married, she's nine, almost 19, and she says to me all the time, when we're talking and we talk over her, because we all talk over each other in my family, I'm ashamed to say, she stops, and then she won't talk to you again. So obviously... This really matters to her. And as I read that one, I thought, ooh, that's Kayla. And I've never done the love languages with her because she's the youngest. Poor child. It's lucky she has clothes. You know what I'm saying? That poor child. She didn't get nearly what the other kids got. I have to pray special for her, and I repent. Now, now I've done her. But anyway, I realized that this is not just a personality thing. This is her, her, one of her love languages, and she really gets upset when you don't just listen to her. So anyway, thank you. What was your two top ones? Okay, those are, yeah, those are, they're good. Yes? Time and words. Okay, how about you? Words of affirmation and receiving gifts. And gifts. Okay, see, some people that give things really, really important. Yes? Uh, quality time and acts of service. Quality time and acts of service. Okay, so, all right, yes? Same, quality time and acts of service. Okay, quality time and acts of service. What'd you get? Words of affirmation and acts of service. Okay, good. Yes? Acts of service and quality time. Okay, we got a lot of that, don't we? Yes? Words of, uh, words of affirmation and acts of service. Okay. I, I dare to say words of affirmation are probably important to all of us to a degree. So, yes, Nick? Quality time and acts of service. Quality time and acts of service. Okay. Yes? Same. Okay. Yes? Quality time and receiving gifts. Okay. Okay, but that was a lot of the fellas that was the case. How about you? Quality time and acts of service. And acts of service. Okay. Acts of service and receiving gifts. Okay. And so you can get it either way, right? They could do something for you or buy something for you. You've got to come in either way. Yes? Receiving gifts and quality time. Receiving gifts and quality time, which we had several fellas up here with that one. That was, that's interesting. Okay, now, I want you to think for a minute. When I learned about this, my father's mother, Grandma Ezel, she's from South Georgia, and no matter what the holiday was, Grandma Ezel would come up with something to give us from the dollar store. She had no money. Or she'd get a card and she'd put silver do uh, half dollars in it, you know, tape them in and give them to you. Guess what Grandma Ezel's primary love language was? Gifts. I did not understand that until almost right before she died. Because when I started studying this, I went, oh, that's my grandmother. And I never understood. She'd give us this weird little stuff and I'm thinking, what is she giving us this for? No, I'm serious. I'm telling you the truth. I loved my grandmother, but she's with the Lord now. But I used to look at it and go, what is she doing? Why doesn't she save her money? You know what I'm saying? And then when I studied this, I felt so badly because I thought, oh, all those years, she's just trying to say I love you because that's how she'd say I love you. And her, uh, one of hers, obviously, also was... Uh, 
uh, acts of service because she would cook for you and she'd, you know, do things for you and she'd make cookies or, you know what I'm saying. And so she was saying, I love you by the things that she was doing. Now, she didn't know a a thing about words of affirmation. Her words were very frequently very cutting. And um, I think she was just speaking the truth in love, but she forgot the in love part there someplace, you know. But um, no, no, but, but she was a loving person. But see, as I got older and I studied this, I understood her better so that I wasn't so offended by her all the time. Does that make sense? Oh, and I'm going to tell you, as a teenager, I was offended by her. She would say things about my dad, which was her son. I drove a long way out of my way to see her once. I sat on her front porch for about 10 minutes. I had driven probably an hour out of my way both t- ways, so two hours um, when I was going up to college and co- or coming back, I can't remember, uh, one of the trips. And she said something about my dad, and I hugged her, and I said, bye, and left because her words in my mind were so cutting. At, but see, that wasn't one of her love languages. And to me, the affirmation thing, it goes a long way towards other people, too. Does that make sense? So words were very, very important to me. Can you think of somebody you're close to that maybe has a different love language than you? Have you heard your mom say to you ever, can't you just clean up the kitchen every once in a while? Yeah? Now, see, my, my, uh, one of my daughters, I won't rat out which one. Obviously, acts of service is not one of hers. And... I have literally caught myself saying to her, you just don't love me or you would clean up after yourself in the kitchen. And then I catch myself because I hear myself and I think, oh, that's me. She doesn't mean it the way I'm perceiving it. Do you see how important it is to understand your own love languages? (laughs) You guys, I hope you appreciate this. I hope it'll bless somebody. I heard Gary Smalley or Chuck... Uh, Charles Swindoll or one of these these marriage gurus that's a Christian say the most important thing you can do to make your marriage work is to be less selfish he said because the biggest problem he sees in marriage is being selfish and I thought that's not the biggest problem I see in marriage the biggest problem I saw in my own marriage was that I was being so selfless that I learned to be bitter towards my husband did you hear what I just said so you people listen up for a minute you know you could be selfish that's always wrong God will call you on that one right But I was so busy trying to be selfless, I was playing the martyr. And then I would get angry with him because he would let me be the martyr. And how could he love me if he let me be the martyr? Does that make sense? And so over time, I was getting very bitter and very angry. And the Lord showed it to me because we're not supposed to have any bitter root in us. So do you know one of the best things I ever did for my husband was? I figured myself out. And then I I tried to protect my husband from me. Did you just hear what I said? And you may need to do that with other people that you're close to. Somebody you're close to, you may have to protect them from yourself. Now, what does that mean? I'm going I'm to give you an example, okay? We had a dog that got, he fell out of a car, and he broke his femur when he was a puppy. And the doctor wanted like $2,500 to fix the dog's femur, and we didn't have the money. So my husband says, we need to put the dog to sleep. And at this point, I was getting sharp to the fact that I needed to protect my husband from myself. Because normally I'd go, "Uh uh-huh, we can't afford that, go ahead. But then what hit me was, because I was praying about it, and I think the Lord showed me this, what hit me was, every time my husband went out and bought something stupid and wasted money, I would remember the dog that we put to sleep. Now, is that my husband's fault that I'm neurotic? No, but I know that's how I am. Every time he ate out at McDonald's or bought some stupid little something, I'd have thought we could have fixed the dog. We could have fixed the dog. We could have fixed the dog. So I said to him, honey, I'm not disagreeing with you, but I think we better fix the dog. And we did. And we made payments on the dog. And that dog is still asleep on my couch at home right now. Okay? He's become, he's a very important little dog to us. All right? But the point, and my husband said it was the right move. But it was about a year later. I said, do you know why we fixed the dog? so that I didn't learn to hate you every time you spent any money on stupid things. And he looked at me and he goes, what? I go, I know me. I realize now that I'd have gotten mad every time you spent money on something stupid and I'd have thought, why didn't we fix the dog? He goes, you're serious? I go, yes, I've learned to protect you from me and it's working pretty well, okay? Now, I know that might sound crazy, but as Christians, you're being taught all your life to be selfless. And I agree, we are to be. But in marriage, you guys need to protect your husbands and gentlemen 
protect your wife from yourself. When I said that to my husband, now my husband tries to protect me from himself. He'll say, I'm having a really bad day. If I seem cranky to you, I'm really not mad at you. I'm just really cranky. And you know how hard it is for a guy to be able to come up with that, that his own feelings are that? But he's trying to protect me from him. You won't read that in any books. Try to protect the people you love from yourself. Haven't you found with one of your best friends, I don't know how you guys are, but us ladies, we can be vicious with our best friends, can't we? Oh, I got lots of giggles because we're girls. You guys look at us and go, they are crazy. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, And ladies, we can be absolutely vicious with our best friends. You know what? Your best friend is your best practice for your husband. I learned that before I ever got married, that my best friend was best practice for my husband because us ladies, we get just as nasty or nice with our best friends. And so start to try practicing uh, protecting your best friend from you. It would be good practice for you for marriage so that when you know something's coming up, you could say, you know, if you do that, I'm going to be really bent. So maybe we need to come up with something else. Practice or on your sister. I know. I can't help you guys. I've never been a guy, so I'm sorry. I'm just, you know. Okay, let's go to the next one. Let's go to uh, personality types. And personality types, I'll tell you what. Everybody has a test here. Discover your personality profile. You see that one? Let's do that first, and then we'll discuss it. So just keep that top sheet, all right? And go ahead. Go ahead and... Let's see, it says begin with column one, work your way through each section marking your response in the space provided. Use the following scale to identify the degree to which each characteristic or behavior most accurately describes how you relate to your loved ones. Zero is not at all, one is somewhat, two is mostly, and three is very much. And you know what, I'm going to do this one with you. Okay, so likes control. So if you like control, not at all, put zero. If you like it somewhat, put one. Two is mostly and three is very much. Okay, confident. If you're confident, are you firm? Do you like challenges? Are you a problem solver? Are you bold? Are you goal driven? Are you strong-willed? Are you self-reliant? Are you persistent? Do you take charge? Are you determined? Are you enterprising? What does that mean? Are you you enterprising? Does Does it mean like you can come up with things? Like to do things? I don't know. Let's skip that one. Uh, Competitive. Are you productive? Are you purposeful? Are you adventurous? Are you independent? Are you action oriented? Okay, now we're under number two. Is everybody up with me? Are you enthusiastic? Are you a visionary? Are you energetic? Are you a promoter? I wonder what that one means. Like, do you help others, maybe? Uh, so let's, yeah, let's think that's what it means. Moves easily. I don't know what that means. Fun-loving. Spontaneous. Uh, likes new ideas. Optimistic. Takes risks. Um, motivator. Very verbal. Friendly. Am I going too fast? Okay. Popular. Enjoys variety. Group oriented. Initiator. Inspirational. What does that mean? Inspirational. You inspire people? You inspire people. Okay. Thank you. I'm going, huh? Okay. Likes change. Sensitive. Calm. Non-demanding. Enjoys routine. Relational. I guess that means you have good relationships with other people. 
adaptable, thoughtful, patient. <laughs> the people at home are going to be laughing because they can see my face when, <laughs> when I'm doing this and my face is going, ooh, ah, ooh. okay, <laughs> sorry guys. Good, good listener. Um, loyal. Even keeled. Ugh. Even keeled means you, you kind of keep them straight. You don't kind of go off this way or that way. You just kind of keep going. That would be even keeled. Gives in. Indecisive. That means you can't make a decision. Dislikes change. Dry humor. Oh, I hate dry humor. Oh, I hope I didn't just hurt somebody's feelings. Now, what I think of as dry humor, no, I like dry humor. I don't like sarcasm. There's, there's a difference, isn't there? So dry humor is not sarcasm, okay? So dry humor, okay. I don't do dry humor, though, but anyway, I'm not good at that. Yes. Dry humor, can we get an example of dry humor? What can we do? It's when they kind of make a joke, but it takes you about three minutes to figure out it was a joke. That's dry humor. Do you know what I'm talking about? Somebody will say something and you'll think and go, what they just said. Okay, sympathetic, nurturing, tolerant, peacemaker, consistent, mm, uh, reserved, practical, factual, perfectionist, Detailed, inquisitive, persistent, sensitive. Didn't we get that before? Yeah. Accurate, controlled, predictable, orderly. I think we already did that one too, didn't we? Didn't do orderly? Okay, let's do orderly. Conscientious. I wish I had a dictionary. Conscientious usually means that you're responsible, that you try to do what you're supposed to. Um, discerning. That means you can discern something from being good or bad. Analytical. That means you're, you like math or something like that. Zero. <laughs> um, well, you might not like math but still be analytical if you think very logically. Okay, that would be that. Precise. Mm -hmm. Scheduled, deliberate. Okay, now we are supposed to total up. Yes, total up each column. Boy, this could take a minute, huh? You guys have a calculator? Total up each column. There are four different types of personalities, and I want you to notice in your reading it didn't mention the, the animals, but it mentioned in your reading the sanguine... Here, let me find it. Hang on. Choleric... Here we go. It's on the bottom of page 55. It mentioned the choleric, sanguine, melancholy, and phlegmatic... The sanguine, excuse me, the choleric is the lion, okay? So you may want to write next to uh, lion, choleric, C-H-O-L-E-R-I-C, choleric. The otter is sanguine, S-A-N-G-U-I-N-E. Um, on this, just write the word, I'm spelling it out to you, the, the technical names that are on your reading on page guessing, 55. I'm guessing melancholy is... Beaver. The, the beaver is the melancholy, and the phlegmatic, well, I, I was spelling the others. Next to beaver, write M-E-L-A-N-C-H-O-L-Y, melancholy. And next to the golden retriever, write, it, phlegmatic starts with a P-H, P-H-L-E-G-M-A-T-I-C. Now, I like the names of the critters better because I can relate to those better. The lion, the lion is choleric, C-H-O-L-E-R-I-C. Now, those are the technical names, but let's be honest. When you hear lion, you think of somebody that's adventurous, determined, outspoken, competitive, strong-willed, right? When you think of an otter, <laughs> I can't remember where I parked because I'm too busy having fun. Okay, I can so relate to that. The golden retriever is somebody that's laid back, 
very sensitive to other people's, but somebody that's laid back. And the beaver tends to be one of those people whose bedroom is always clean. I so can't relate. Um, Amanda, did you have your hand up, sweetie? The otter is a sanguine. S-A-N-G-U-I-N-E. Now, shh, let's look here. Where underneath, it says, discover the value of your personality types when relational strengths are out of balance. Okay, so let's look at the value. So if you're, how many of you, now you'll probably have more than one. Most people have at least two dominant ones. Do you know what I think is interesting? When I was early in my marriage and I took this for the first time, I was definitely a lion otter cross. Okay, I am bossy. It's a terrible thing. But I'm also, ah, ha, ha, have a good time. Can't remember where I parked the car. You know, I'm all about that. Okay. And now when I just did this, I still am predominantly lion, I'm ashamed to say. Um, but now uh, the, wow, the beaver has come up from where it used to be. So now I've still got a lot of otter but I've almost got as much beaver. And I got a lot more of the golden retriever than I used to. I used to be almost no golden retriever, and now I'm in the 30s on my golden retriever. So do you know what that says to me? Okay. And beaver is your high. You know what I'm thinking, though, because mine has changed so much? I'm 57 years old. I spent a lot of time in God's Word, and I really have asked Him to change me, make me love people like He loves people, really try. And I think what I'm seeing is a shift in my personality as He sanctifying me, that I'm becoming more caring about other people because I didn't used to be. Do you see what I'm saying? And so I think He's actually shifting my personality. But let's look. A lion takes charge as a problem solver. They're competitive. They enjoy change. See, I don't enjoy change, I don't think. And they're confrontational. I am confrontational. I hate com competition. I used to be very competitive, but as a Christian, I've decided it's not a healthy thing for me. Okay? I'm not going to say for you. The people that get to the Olympics that are um, Olympians, they say they compete with themselves, not other people. I find that it's, un it's not the best thing in the world to be competitive as a Christian. Just compete with yourself and, and do the very best you can as and honor God with it. That's personal. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Okay? Great. God bless you. Um, I definitely am a problem solver, but look under the lion where it can be a problem. Too direct or impatient. Oh my goodness, I have been so convicted of that. Too busy. Uh-huh. Got a problem with that. Cold-blooded. Sometimes. And then I have to repent. My husband will look at me and goes, I can't believe that came out of your mouth. You know, that kind of thing. Impulsive. Takes big risks. Hmm. I am very impulsive. I'm not, I don't do big risks, but I'm very impulsive. My husband says I'm unaware. That's what he says I am. It's not that I'm a, a big risk taker. It's that I just kind of go, uh-huh, you know, and I do it. You know what I mean? So I'm unaware. Um, insensitive to others. It happens, but I don't mean to be. And then I have to go back and say I'm sorry and repent. Um, let's look at otter, the good part. How many of you are otters? Or at least halfway. Yeah, got a lot of otters in the room. Otters are optimistic. They're energetic. They're motivators. They're future-oriented. They like to have a good time. Yeah. My husband says we're all about the experience. We don't need to own things. We just want to have the fun. And it's, it's true. That's how we are. And so, but otters can be unrealistic or daydreamers. We can be impatient and overbearing. We can be manipulative, manipulative or pushy. And sometimes we avoid details or lack of follow-through. And I have had that problem in my life. Golden retrievers, good things. Warm and real. How many are golden retrievers? Yes, I'm, my daughter is marrying a golden retriever. I'm so pleased. I'm so happy for her because he's so laid back and so sweet, loves the Lord, but he's just so laid back. And I look at him and go, that is so cool. And so um, they're warm and relational. They're loyal. They, they enjoy routine. They're peacemakers. They're very sensitive to other people's feelings. And then the problems are that they can sometimes uh, attract the hurting they miss opportunities because they're very slow to respond. I have seen that in him. Um, they stay in ruts, sacrifice their own feelings. I think that's true. And they easily are hurt or hold grudges. And then the beaver, and one of my favorite people in the world, my mom is a beaver. Um, they are accurate and precise. They are quality control, uh, discerning and analytical. 
Um, they tend, like I said, to have their room clean all the time, which kind of scares me. I don't. <laughs> I'm, I'm more of an otter. No, my room looks like I just went swimming in there. Anyway, um, then I clean it up, but then it gets back there again. You know, it's terrible. And then beavers can be too critical or too strict. They can be too controlling. They can be too negative towards uh, uh, new opportunities. Um, and they can lose overview. Let me, let me tell you, before I learned about this, I had my first daughter and she was about eh, four years old. And I looked at her, you know, I'm an otter. Okay. I mean, I'm heavily otter. I'm a lion too, but I'm an otter. And I looked at her and I go, let's go have some fun. I was going to take her to the park. You know, let's go have some fun. I'll never forget this. My little kid looks up at me and goes, mom, you're weird. <laughs> and I remember thinking, what's wrong with this picture? I mean, I'm trying to take the kid to have some fun. Now, guess what my oldest daughter is not? She's not an otter. My oldest daughter is a lion beaver cross. My mom's a lion beaver cross, too, so I should have gotten it. But she just looked at me like, no. Now, what did God send me for my second child? An otter! Yay! So guess who I ride horses with? My second daughter. You know, my first daughter will ride with me, don't get me wrong. But my second daughter is the one that actually owns the other horse. Okay? So, and then my youngest daughter, you know, I really need to do her. I probably should have done her 18 years ago. But I really need to do her, and I, I need her to do her, her fiancé so that they can help to understand one another. Can you see how this would really... We're not done, guys. Don't pack up. We have four minutes, and we're going to use it. Okay? Uh, can you really see how this would help to understand? Now, who in your life... Maybe that your brother or a, your friend, have you wondered, why, why won't they do that? Right? I got a couple smiles in here. Yeah, isn't there somebody in your life you wondered what's wrong with them? Why do they think that way? Okay, that's where this will help. Because if you're aware that they may have a different personality type, then you can start to become more sensitive to that person. I'm going to tell you where this can get very dangerous. These personality differences can get very dangerous when you have a father who say is military and he's heavy duty lion uh, beaver and he has a son that's phlegmatic. There have been situations like that where the, the kids have been driven to suicide because they felt like they couldn't ever please the father. And had the father understood personality types or even the kid understood personality types, they might not have been driven to those extremes. Does that make sense? So when I tell you this is important information, I'm not playing with you because I've heard situations like that. This is very, very important information. So that when, like I said, I looked at my daughter and thought, what's wrong with this child? And then when I learned about personality types, I thought, okay, this kid's got a very different personality type given by God than what I have. And so I needed to, and I still, she and I are in business together and we still run into each other like this sometime. And it's the personality differences because mom wants to just run right in, you know. Okay, let's just do it. And my daughter's like, oh, my goodness, mom, we haven't thought this through. We don't know what it's going to cost. We don't know this or that. And I'm like, yeah, so? And that's those differences in personality types. Now, I'm not saying I'm totally that way. I don't want you to think that. But, but I, I am, honestly, I realize this. This is why I teach chemistry well. I, now, did you hear me? Is that weird? I figured out that's why I teach chemistry well. You know why? Because I'm not one that has to have everything in place before I get started. If I can get started, I go ahead and get started and figure it out and pull the stuff I need along the way. That's exactly how I teach you to do chemistry. I teach you to do chemistry by starting and then pulling the stuff you need along the way. And most people can do chemistry that way. But if you have to be able to sit down and figure out the whole picture before you get started, most people can't. And it took me years to figure out that's actually why I'm a good chemistry teacher is because I have that weird personality. And it actually helps to help people that just need to see the pieces and then put them together instead of having to have the whole picture put together first. So do you see how God can use even these weird little personality things about us? Do you all see how these things could help you to understand other people and have better relationships with them? Now, we didn't go over the learning styles, but did that help you to figure out your own learning style? Okay, because that'll help you to study, and that will really help you in your life to study more efficiently. All right, you guys, we'll have a little more fun next week. Have a Jesus-filled week.